Thank you to everyone who is joining us today. My name is Lindsay Killen, and I'm the Vice President for Strategic Outreach and Communications at the Mackinac Center. Where we're looking forward to a really timely and lively discussion with leaders who have some of the most intimate knowledge and experience with exposing government overreach, and we'll share with you some solutions for restoring bureaucracy in particular to a reasonable and limited role. Before we dive in, first I'm going to go over some housekeeping rules for today's discussion. We'll have a casual conversation with our panelists before opening it up for Q&A at the end. To ask a question, simply click on the Q&A box to the right of your screen and type in your question in the chat box. And now I'd like to introduce Mackinac Center President Joe Lehman for a brief update from the Mackinac Center before we dive into the panel's discussion. An engineer by training, Joseph Lehman joined the Mackinac Center in 1995 and was named president in 2008. During his tenure, Michigan has seen numerous free market advances in education, labor, state, and, and fiscal policy affairs. Frequently published in national and state media, Lehman has also trained more than 600 public policy executives internationally on strategic leadership and communications. He and his wife are founders of Midland County Habitat for Humanity. Joe, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Lindsay, and good morning to the Mackinac Center friends and supporters who are tuning in. And uh, I want to brag right now. I want to brag on uh, the great folks on the Mackinac Center team because the Mackinac Center has been recognized uh, for three awards. And the awards were given by a group called the State Policy Network, which is sort of the national association of think tanks like the Mackinac Center that focus on state policies. And those awards recognize our, our marketing uh, campaigns, recognize our work in education policy, and recognize our ability to work with other think tanks uh, on, at the outbreak of the pandemic. Our marketing campaign that won the award was actually a series of cartoons that you may have seen because we decided the best way to draw attention to some of the inconsistencies, uh, what we believed were inconsistencies in Governor Whitmer's emergency orders, uh, was to poke a little bit of fun at those. And uh, viewers agreed and these cartoons uh, made the rounds on social media and elsewhere. And we started to notice a pattern when we would publish a cartoon uh, poking fun at uh, an emergency order, as often as not, uh, the governor would uh, revise or, <laughs> or withdraw the emergency order. Uh, things as simple as it's okay to take a walk on a golf course, but not if you're carrying a golf club. And it turns out if you've got a good artist like we did in Ilea Vanderhoof, uh, you, can, you can make that pretty funny visually. But we also uh, took a more serious approach um, in, in winning an award called the Ed Prize. This is the first year the Ed Prize Award has been given, and that was for an idea we've put out there uh, that says, in times when public schools aren't even really open uh, at full capacity and sometimes at almost no capacity, parents should be able to take the funds that are available for educating children and spend those funds however they need to to get their kids the education they need. So uh, we're still hoping to make some policy progress on that, but even our idea has been recognized for an award. And the third award was the Network Award. We worked very closely with seven other state think tanks around the country in a healthcare working group, uh, Lindsay, uh, on today's show was was actually a big part of that. And uh, it, it's a little hard to remember now, but in the early days of the pandemic, we made some real progress uh, working with the governor, having some of our ideas adopted that made it easier for medical professionals to practice. It made it easier for people to find care uh, without jumping through uh, as many bureaucratic hoops while still maintaining safety. So uh, thanks for letting me brag about those things. and. If you've been following the work of the Mackinac Center, you'll see that we've continued to publish meaningful research. Uh, my colleague, Mike LaFave, uh, working with our adjunct scholar, Michael Hicks, published a study looking at Michigan's corporate welfare programs going back to 1983. And here's the nugget to remember. 
the state has spent uh, about six, almost six hundred thousand dollars per job for every job that they uh, that they actually uh, were were able to create. That's six hundred thousand dollars a year, and so uh, it's really all you uh, all a normal person programs are ineffective. And uh, so now we've got more data to, to make that case. And in a year when the budget is under tremendous stress, uh, the state budget, we, we don't need to be subsidizing companies uh, uh, at, at such a high cost. We've also uh, published a report about the failure of the dams in Midland County, which made big news nationwide in, in May. You can find that online. And um, our colleague Mike Van Beek, also on today's show, is the author of our latest study on the 1945 Emergency Powers Act, uh, which Governor Whitmer is, uh, uh, that, that's, he says, the source of her authority uh, for the, the uh, emergency that she has declared and, and um, uh, without input from the legislature. And so uh, Mike has written a very good uh, review of, of that law. And a week ago today, uh, our attorneys appeared before the Michigan Supreme Court challenging that law. Uh, so we did sue the governor uh, directly uh, on, on behalf of the medical providers and some medical patients who weren't able to get care because of the governor's emergency orders. And uh, something uh, fascinating happened in those oral arguments. They went on for three and a half hours. And I'm told that it's not an all-time record, but Patrick Wright, our senior litigator, told me that uh, there was a case more than a century ago where the court blocked out a whole day for arguments. And so uh, the arguments uh, that we were part of a week ago at three and a half hours uh, were um, historic in, in their own way. So we are we could get a decision from the state Supreme Court any any day now. <clears throat> uh, I'll wrap up because I know some of you are very interested in our work with helping unionized workers exercise their rights with respect to uh, paying union dues and fees. And we have been educating workers now for two years since a US Supreme Court decision. That decision was called the Janus decision. And our latest estimate is that where we've been educating workers, union membership is down about 16% in those areas. And that's purely uh, a function of letting workers know about a right that they probably didn't know they had until uh, we were able to tell them about uh, that right. Before I turn it back over to Lindsay, I want to thank you again, Mackinac Center friends and supporters. And I want to personally thank you because some of you were aware that uh, I was sick. I'm one of the people who got uh, who contracted COVID, and uh, so I've had my own experience with it. Now everything was fine. I was I was never hospitalized, but uh, uh, I can report that uh, COVID is real. Uh, you should uh, you should take it uh, seriously. Uh, but it is uh, something uh, that uh, that's one reason we're continuing to make it a very serious uh, part of our public policy uh, portfolio. And uh, the, the, the trick is to find out what should government's role be. And so we'll be talking a lot about regulation today. And Lindsay, I'll turn it back over to you. Glad that you're feeling much better now and making a full recovery. Now I have the pleasure of introducing our two panelists for today, Philip Howard, chair of commongood.org and Mike Van Beek of the Mackinac Center. Philip Howard is a well-known leader of government and legal reform in America. A lawyer and best-selling author, he is founder of the Bipartisan Campaign for Common Good. His books include the national bestseller, The Death of Common Sense, and most recently, Try Common Sense. His 2000 and TED Talk has been reviewed more than 700,000 times. Philip is a prominent civic leader in New York City and has advised national political leaders of both parties on legal and regulatory reform, as well as governors across the nation. A graduate of Yale College and the University of Virginia Law School, he is senior counsel at the law firm Covington and Burling LLP. Mike Van Beek is director of research for the Mackinac Center for Public Policy. He has authored several studies for the center as well as analysis and commentaries that have been published in the Wall Street Journal, the Detroit News, the Detroit Free Press, 
the Grand Rapids Press, and the Oakland Press, as well as numerous other publications. So Philip, please take a moment to introduce yourself and the mission of Common Good. Thanks, Lindsay, and thanks, thanks Joe and Mike, the Mackinac Center, for having me. Um, you know, our mission is basically to uh, simplify regulatory structures that have grown up, that sort of accreted like sediment in the harbor over the last 50 years, so that we have this paralytic state. You know, it can take up to a decade to get a permit for a new power line, or fix a bridge or something. You know, teachers have lost control of the classroom. Doctors spend two hours on desk work for every hour they spend uh, with patients. So we've created this state that drives everybody nuts. And um, it's mainly related not to the scope of government, although there are lots of issues about the scope of government, related to government's operating system. You know, how does government make choices? What is it, how much freedom does it allow citizens to use their common sense and officials to use their common sense? And, uh, it, and we think, it's impossible to fix. There are 150 million words of binding federal regulation alone, several billion words if you count all the state regulation. And you couldn't, you can't wander into this jungle of red tape with scissor, you know, with um, uh, shears and, and make any sense of it. So we think we're at a point in this society where we really need to reboot government, not to get rid of its legitimate goals. People want clean air and um, they want protection against pandemics and such, but to make it practical and to make it work and to get rid of this idea that uh, it's kind of a software program that if only you studied these thousand page manuals hard enough, the world would be perfect. Of course, what happens is the world is paralyzed and everybody spends all their time with the noses and rule books. You could write cartoon, draw cartoons about that. Um, so we just launched this campaign for common good, and we have a bunch of former governors and senators from both parties, uh, leading experts in almost every area of society, basically saying it's time for spring cleaning commission. It's time to reboot government. So we're out trying to find support, and I'd love to get support and work with the Mackinac Center. I know Mike has done this wonderful study on overcriminalization in, in Michigan law. There's just exhibit A for how law can kind of grow out of controls and nobody can knows what it is and you can get in trouble, you know, for doing anything. Um, so, uh, you know, we think we're at a point where Americans are fed up, Washington hasn't gotten the message, so we're going to have to organize ourselves to, um, to get together, to form a coalition of coalitions with the Mackinac Center, with groups in other states, um, uh, get leading citizens in each place and really force it on Washington. I mean, Washington is broken, Americans know it, and we need a kind of a clear vision about how to fix it. Can't hear you. Hello? Thank you so much for that, Philip. We're very excited to have you on the program today with Mike to talk about this issue. You both have done tremendous research into government's ever-expanding brain over our everyday lives. So let's dive right into today's uh, conversation. Mike, I'm going to start with you. Your research has specifically explored the Michigan administrative state, and as Philip noted, you took a particularly hard look at how Michigan bureaucracy determines what constitutes criminal behavior. So what should Michiganders know about these regulations and why are they so concerning? Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, well, let me let me start explaining this problem by defining a couple of terms. Uh, laws and statutes, uh, these are, I'll refer to these, these are uh, the kind of the, the policies that get all the attention. They, they need to pass through the legislature, they vote on them, the governor signs them into law. Uh, on the other hand, you have rules and regulations. These are uh, policies that are created by state agencies, state departments, and, and bureaucrats. And the way that uh, those work is that the legislature in a law will empower a state agency to write a rule to enforce that law. So just as a silly example, the, the legislature could say, uh, everyone in, we want everyone in Michigan to be healthy. And then they might say to the Department of Health, write rules to make sure everyone is healthy. Uh, Silly example, but that's essentially the way that this works. Now, in Michigan, 
state law says that bureaucrats through state agencies cannot create criminal behavior. They can't define a, a, a violating a rule. They can't assign a criminal penalty to it. But there is a workaround, and this happens all the time. What happens is the legislature creates a law that says anyone who violates this law is guilty of a misdemeanor or guilty of a felony. Then it says, and anyone who violates any of the rules promulgated under this law is also guilty of a misdemeanor or a felony. Now, those rules haven't even been written yet, but the legislature says you're criminally punishable if you violate those rules that a state agency will write in the future. So that's the, that is the issue that we have, and it's a huge problem in Michigan. Uh, one of the main reasons it's a large problem is because the, uh, just of the sheer size of the regulatory state, the number of rules and regulations that we have in this state uh, are impossible to keep track of. So we did our best guess of trying to figure out. Looks like we lost Mike's audio there for a second. So we'll give him an opportunity to hop back on here, but uh, he's leaving us hanging because he was just getting to the good stuff. Uh, so here, you know, until he is able to jump back on, uh, I've got, uh, I want to turn it back over to Philip because you have looked at this issue as well and you've not, you've, you've taken a, a sort of national look. You've looked at uh, this issue at the federal, state and local level. So um, as Mike jumps back on here, could you go ahead and chime in on uh, what you've seen, you know, Mike talked about how these rulemaking processes have a large impact on uh, how people are able to comply right. on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, could you right. uh, tell us what you've seen? Yeah, there's this paradox. Um, everybody thought that if you made law really specific and clear, that then everyone would know exactly what was right and what was wrong, and there wouldn't be any argument. That was the idea. And conservatives fell for this too, because they didn't want any general powers by officials. They might abuse their power. So whatever, whatever a, a regulator did, it had to be pursuant to very clear rules. The problem is when you get, and Mike's paper proves this perfectly, when you get um, uh, one idea after another, and year after year it adds up, no human can know it. It's a, just literally, it's just too many rules. Nobody can know what they are. And then the people, even within the government itself. So, for example, there was this study in Illinois, if you know, about nursing home regulation. There like a thousand rules. Uh, you know, how many pictures are on the walls, when the meals have to be, what the meals consist of, anything anybody can think of. <laughs> and it turned out, that even the inspectors didn't know the rules. So they would end up enforcing whatever small percentage they understood. And, um, and the people in the nursing home spent most of their time during the day or much of their time figuring out how to go down this really long checklist of rules. Australia got rid of all their rules like that for nursing homes replaced them with 31 general principles. Within a year, the nursing homes were twice as good. And they went in and study it, and why was it? Because the people in the nursing homes went to work spending their time thinking about what the residents needed and wanted instead of complying with the rule books. So what's happened is in the name of regulation, that's supposedly clear, we've created this regulatory state that, that no human can understand, uh, and that this counterproductive because it diverts people from doing their job properly towards complying with all the rules. It's like the world's longest checklist. So that's another reason why you can't just go in and tweak it to work better. It's not just that it's idiotic, which, so Mike's paper on criminalization in Michigan statutes really demonstrates all the inconsistencies in these laws. But they're not just idiotic, they're beyond the scope of human comprehension or, or compliance. People can't abide by it. So we've created, in the name of avoiding arbitrary government, we've created a government that is literally arbitrary, that, that you, can, you can get um, uh, 
you can violate the law with criminal fines for something you didn't even know existed and is often inconsistent with some other rule. It's, you know, it's like some dystopian novel, you know, George Orwell wrote it. You know, so, you know, and that's the point we're trying to get across to people that you really have to do a spring cleaning. And so anyway, that's one of the things I'd like to talk about. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I think the arbitrary nature of a lot of these regulations is what is, you know, most is what's most outrageous about them. And as people find out about how unfairly these rules and regulations are applied and how some conflict with one another really just boggles the mind how we let ourselves get to this place. I think we have Mike Van Beek back on now. And Mike, you were just getting to the nuts and bolts of what you had found there in your study. And Philip, you know, mentioned while you were offline, you know, about those problems you were first discussing about, you know, first you have the laws and then you have the rules that come with the laws. And oftentimes people aren't even usually aware of the laws that pass, much less the rulemaking processes behind those laws, which can often take months after the laws pass as well. And the rules can change. So tell us, you know, what you what you feel, you know, based on your study and your research has been the most alarming revelations. Well, I think Philip was alluding to this earlier, but just the sheer size of the rules and the rule book is is astounding. So in Michigan, the first the first thing is that, as Philip said, the state doesn't even know how many rules it has. It doesn't even count them. It can't count them. So we tried our best to figure this out. And what we found was there's at least 750 different rule sets. So that's like subjects that are that are guided by rules. But then within those sets, we estimated there's about 17000 different rules that make up all those different rule sets. And there's over 100 different state agencies or departments or commissions or committees that enforce these rules and write these rules. So it is is such a hodgepodge of of information that it really is impossible to keep track of. The good news is that only my best estimate is only about half of those carry criminal penalties with them. That's still way too many, but at least half don't. But the bigger problem is that it's really impossible to tell because these rules are so incomprehensible. So just I want to give you some examples of how how these work and how they're impossible to decipher. Some of them are clearly outdated. They are some are clearly no longer applicable. Others are made redundant by other rules and laws. My favorite example of redundancy in Michigan rules is we have rules about racehorse. Hardly anybody does racehorse anymore, but we have rules about it because they used to. And we have a rule set for each breed of racehorse. So particular rules about each breed. And all those rules are basically the same, but we have five different sets for each breed. Then we have another set of rules that is for all breeds of horses. And that is very similar to the rules that for the individual breeds. And on top of that, we have a state law that has almost the exact same language that also applies to all horses or all racehorses. So it's like we just have these three layers of duplication, redundancy. And, you know, it's really impossible to know which rule set or law is applicable to your particular situation. And so that's just, you know, one example of how these laws are incomprehensible. You know, it's 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 crazy as well. If you've ever had the I wouldn't say privilege, but opportunity to attend one of these rulemaking procedures, they often take place in succession over a period of days or weeks or sometimes months. And and you have and you would think that you have the same people making the laws in the room being a part of making the rules. And that's really not always. In fact, it may be very seldom the case. 
it's, uh, it's a lot of the times it depends on who actually shows up to these rulemaking procedures as to who is shaping the rules that make these laws. And uh, so it's, um, it's even more arbitrary when you think about it from that respect as well. And it's, it's somewhat understandable to see how we can end up with all of these various rules about different horses and breeds. <laughs> um, you know, Mike, uh, we'll uh, just uh, go back to uh, the, you know, the, the political nature of these things. Um, there's, uh, there's obviously a lot of arbitrary, uh, you know, processes that go into making these rules and regulations that, that have this sort of disparate and senseless impact. But uh, as partisanship has grown over the last uh, few years, and especially in a, in a presidential election year when partisan politics is at its height, um, it would seem like this area of government or this, this issue would be ripe for giving policymakers an opportunity to work across party lines, because you would think that issues like government transparency are, you know, appeal to, to voters on both sides of the aisle. So, you know, do you see opportunities for for reform, uh, you know, given this political climate on this issue that maybe didn't exist before or, or an opportunity to prioritize this area of reform more so than uh, we have in the past? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we do have a moment here where uh, this particular issue should be attractive for uh, partisans from both uh, both sides of the aisle. And uh, two examples of similar issues uh, over criminalization is a, is a broad issue about uh, that is related to this, which is just uh, the idea that the U.S. and states have way too many uh, laws on the books that enforce criminal penalties uh, and that uh, they should reduce those and create uh, more consistent, uh, more general uh, laws about crimes. So that's that's one area that has, uh, you know, gotten support on both sides. And then the other one is occupational licensing, which is also a, a regulatory regime that prevents people from uh, working, earning a living unless they get state approval. And that also has been uh, supported by both sides um, of the aisle. Uh, President Obama was uh, interested in reforming occupational licensing, and President Trump is interested in, oc in occupational licensing reform. So those are two areas uh, where I think we're making progress. But this really, the, the issue of over-regulating over, uh, is, is one that should uh, be attractive to both sides, because if you're a conservative, uh, rule-of-law kind of person, um, you think that's important. This is uh, an affront to the idea of the rule of law, because we allow unelected bureaucrats to write policy that individuals have to abide by. And it's policy that even carries criminal penalties, which is the most powerful thing that the government can do. It's the, it's the gravest power we give the government to say to them, you can determine who to lock up and who can have their freedom. Um, and we right now are allowing unelected bureaucrats to make those decisions. That's a very uh, serious problem for the rule of law. The other, if, if you're from the, if you're, if you're from the other side, potentially, uh, on the left, uh, you should be concerned about this as well, because as Philip has said, these rules, they're so vast, uh, that the enforcement of them has to be, has to be, uh, arbitrary as well. So, uh, uh, law enforcement has to pick and choose which rules they apply and which ones they enforce and on whom and where. And uh, that is a kind of system, an enforcement, law enforcement system, which can lead to um, uh, people being mistreated or maltreated or uh, treated differently uh, because of their race or their gender or uh, anything like that any other sort of characteristic that is unrelated to the law. So what we need is protections in the law so that it is applied equally to everyone and a, and a system that allows unelected bureaucrats to write these rules and selectively enforce them is not that kind of system. It's, it's, um, it, it is ripe for abuse. So Philip, I'd like to get your input on that question as well. you work with governors around the country, you've been working uh, at the federal level. Um, are you similarly seeing some trends that point to being able to 
uh, take on this issue more seriously and bring together people from both sides of the aisle? Uh, uh, no. Uh, you know, uh, I agree with Mike that this is a moment for change. The surveys have rarely shown more public support for major structural overhaul of government, really both, both sides of voters. But the political system is really stuck in a kind of trench warfare where, where the issue being presented to voters is, are you for government or against it? And I think that's the wrong choice uh, because, you know, one side gets elected, the other side gets elected, but we don't actually make it work better. So there's a lot to argue about when it comes to the scope of regulation. As Mike said, you know, there's so many stupid things that we just ought to get rid of. Uh, licensing laws, all that stuff on horse, horse training, <laughs> yeah. the 5,000 rules that uh, that apply to an apple orchard. I mean, I could do stand-up comedy on, on the rules. But um, the, uh, uh, but most people want things to work. They don't, uh, they don't want the rivers to be polluted, but the environmental laws ought to be more practical, allow people to use their common sense. And Mike talks about problems with the rule of law. There are problems with the rule of law, including by who writes the laws, so there clearly ought to be more legislative oversight over, um, over, over, over rule writing, but the nature of law has also been forgotten. Uh, law is supposed to, it's a negative concept, it's supposed to protect people against bad things. People can't cheat, they can't loot, they can't commit crimes, and, they, and law sets boundaries, outer boundaries, and within those boundaries, people are supposed to be free. They're free to disagree with each other. They're free to do things in their own way. The, the, so law defines a field of freedom. And what's happened is not just that sometimes the wrong people are writing the law, but that law is not, doesn't make outer boundaries. It actually reaches into our daily lives and says, you must have two pictures on the wall in a nursing home. You must have this many peas on the plate. Or it tells an apple orchard, owner, he has to cover the apple cart with a cloth when the picked apples are taken to the barn to be washed to protect against bird droppings. Well, those apples have been growing on a tree for five months, and the government has not protected them against bird droppings. <laughs> for all the fun. It's a completely absurd rule, you know, and it's way over detailed. And so, uh, in that case, regulation ought to focus on what it takes to have clean apples. Uh, nursing homes ought to, regular oversight ought to be, well, what does it take to have um, caring and clean and effective nursing homes? And and the way you achieve those things is not with thousand page rule books, and they do this in other countries. They'll have an oversight agency that will come in and evaluate, say, a hospital. Look at this. And they won't give you tickets for footfalls. They'll say, you know, you could improve in the following ways, blah, 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 blah. Fine, that's a really good role for government to make sure people are doing their job properly. But it's not this system. And so what's happened with our uh, regulatory structure, it's become incredibly disjointed. It's like this disjointed form of micromanagement, it's like the worst of all worlds. The rules are written one at a time. So there's some rule on horses that were written in 1963 or something. Uh, and so there's some dead person who is governing us. <laughs> you know, some dead person wrote that rule, and some dead person wrote another rule, and they stay in place forever. Well, other countries actually have, in a few states, uh, they, they, they call them sort of, um, uh, I think they're legislative review departments, and their job is to make sure that the codes actually fit with each other and make sense with each other. They're actually codes. We don't have codes in this country. We have junk piles. We have junk piles of stuff piled on and piled on. And this is a problem that can't be fixed except by starting over. You have to actually appoint an independent commission, like a base closing commission or something, to go into some area, like hospitals, nursing homes, you name it, 
and say, here's a proposed simplified code that might work to accomplish public goals without driving people crazy. And, um, and we don't even have that narrative right now. And the Democrats, I think, are really making a big mistake in not talking about this because anybody who hates government, we're talking about two thirds of Americans now, anybody who hates government has only one narrative to go to, which is get rid of it, right? We don't like government. So um, it's, so I'm, I'm uh, you know, unless this group on this call, you know, so what we're trying to do is build, uh, a, as I said, a kind of a group of groups that says, hey, wait a minute, let's, let's be American and be practical. Let's just make sense of this because you, all you have to do is read Mike's paper. You know, somebody ought to go in and just make sense of this Michigan code that nobody even knows what it is because nobody wrote it. A bunch of dead people piled on ideas and we just accept them and nobody goes and cleans them up. No, it's, uh, you know, you've articulated a, a momentous challenge <laughs> uh, that, that faces us if we actually want to make headway in reforming our regulatory structure. Uh, so you mentioned one step that we could take, which is to establish a commission or, you know, have a body essentially write a simplified code and propose that as a sort of reform in a baby step. You, I know you have a sort of blueprint uh, for where we can start to take take this on. So I'd like to hear your thoughts about, you know, what's a, what does a step-by-step -step process actually look like? And I'd like to get Mike's thoughts about that as well, particularly with Michigan in mind. Um, well, I think, um, um, you know, I think you have to, it's probably best to do it area by area. But, but but I think Congress should should create um, let's talk about federal now a spring cleaning commission that would apply. We could you, you know there might be a safety spring cleaning commission. Look at consumer product safety, safety in the workplace. All these things are notoriously dirty. Um, um, and and have. Uh, a group of people who are known to be kind of authorities in that come and propose a better code, just like a small group of experts created the Uniform Commercial Code in the 1950s to replace the then 48 state different contract laws. So, so if you're doing business across the country, you can rely on the same set of principles. That's the kind of thing we need for, 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 for safety codes. There should clearly in the state of Michigan, be a spring cleaning commission that simply goes through regulatory codes and makes recommendations about eliminating, clarifying, simplifying uh, not only the regulations but also the statute. And um, it, it's actually uh, you'd be amazed at how easy it is to do because once you set the goal of not making sense of a bunch of stupid rules, but what you ask yourself the question, how much oversight do we need of racehorses? <laughs> Pretty soon, if you're in Michigan, you say not much. Uh, we'll apply whatever the national standards are and have a general law that says you've got to be humane or whatever. And that would be it. You could probably replace all those rules with five lines. Um, so, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing I think that would begin to um, pick government out of people's lives. You'd go into schools and say, how much authority does a teacher need to run a classroom? Because right now the teacher doesn't have authority to run a classroom. She's got to go to a legal hearing anytime any parent complains. Well, that means that she loses control of the classroom. Well, that's crazy. You know, there shouldn't be legal hearings because Johnny was sent home because he threw a pencil. You're not sending him to jail, you're sending him home. So. You know, there are lots of really simple things that could be done that would improve the way society works. Yeah, Mike, what are your thoughts about where we can start here in Michigan? Is it a baby step? Uh, do we uh, take a look at those uh, those regulations regarding the various horse breeds? 
I mean, surely there's a place to start, and uh, and it, but but we've got to put for we've articulated the problems. Now let's can we find a solution? Yeah, I I think so. I mean, it's uh, it, it is difficult though because we have to recognize the fact that there is no incentive for the state to do this. Uh, it, it doesn't impact anyone who is a, an elected official or who is a bureaucrat in a state department. Uh, it doesn't affect them. It affects us. Uh, so, you know, voters, citizens, we're the ones who need to make this happen and need to make a push for it. Um, I, I think absolutely, you know, the, the very first thing to do is just figure out which rules actually apply. <laughs> so in Michigan, they're, they're so outdated um, and duplicative. Uh, that you know the first thing is just what are the actual rules that that exist now um and and then after that i think a review of them and uh, is is in order but i i will say uh governor snyder did this uh, a review of the regulatory code in michigan with the intent of streamlining it and uh putting it in order and making more sense of it and uh it took a state agency, a new department of, of government um, years to look through these codes and they got rid of like 12 rules is all. Right. Uh, so, you know, it was a major undertaking and they made very little progress. And and as far as I know, there was, it wasn't a lack of interest. It just, it, um, or it wasn't that there was, that they found it didn't need to be cleaned up. It's just they kind of lost interest in it and it sort of faded away that effort. So it really is a, a thing that voters and citizens need to need to push legislators to do because they really don't have an incentive um, to to do it themselves. Yeah, uh, yeah, I feel like, um, you know, I think I do it a little differently. Um, um, you know, one of the problems with government is it's really in the grips of uh, it's like a mighty engine for the status quo. You know, all those interest groups and lobbyists exist to keep things the way they are, not to yeah. change them. So um, once you start talking about a particular rule, people will uh, say, well, the reason that rule is there, and what if somebody is still of the Han and they decide to do something terrible? You know, you get these kind of what if kind of questions. Um, you, you know, I think I would, um, um, take objectives. So, for example, take permitting for business. I would say, well, what's, uh, you know, what's, what's the permitting environment like in the state of Michigan? How many different agencies are there? So other countries have one-stop shops for permits. I would look at what would be reasonable for permitting in different kinds of areas and, and have a group come up with a, with a model and an objective and a timeline and a and a organizational model like one stop shops, yeah, so the, the citizen doesn't have to deal with eleven different agencies, whatever. Um, and make that recommendation and simply come up with a new set of rules that might draw on the old ones, but doesn't pick up the old ones one by one. Um, I do the same thing for well, you know, what's the oversight we really need in schools? Because schools are just crushed with uh, the secretion of dictates from the federal government about how to keep track of nutritional guidelines and, you know, due process requirements for ordinary daily discipline, uh, you know, one thing or another. You know, um, you know, what do we really need? What kind of oversight do we really need uh, for, for schools? And what's the most effective way of doing it? And if you gave that assignment, to a um, to a small committee that included school experts and a management expert, and so you would have you wouldn't have ten volumes, you'd have a pamphlet, which is by the way the way law used to work. Forest rangers used to be in charge of a million or so acres. They had a pamphlet of principles. They did a pretty good job. Now they've got volumes of rules because of the changed law after the sixties. So I think I would. Uh, rather than picking a fight over each rule, I would come up with a code that says, here is our objectives, here's our proposal for how to do it, and we'll revisit it in two years to see how it's working, and we'll change it again because nothing works as intended. Um, 
And, uh, and boy, boy, I agree entirely, though. It's not going to happen because you go to Ann Arbor and say, pretty please. <laughs> you know, it's just not the way the, you know, it's just not the way the world works. We really have to build a, a, a base of, of support from different city groups, you know, starting with the Mackinac Center, but business groups and others, you know, have it debated at the Detroit Economic Club, you know, get big business involved. Let's make, and the, the objectives is, um, there's this line in a new book that just came out this week by some friends of mine called The Wake Up Call. And they have a chapter entitled, um, make, Gover make America Work Again. <laughs> you know, not make America great again, but make America work again. And their point is just this point, which is that nothing works, is it? Because we're not allowed to make it work. Yeah, I wanna add on uh, just uh, one more element to this, uh, which is related more to the work that uh, I did in Michigan, looking at the administrative rules that we have and the ones that are criminally uh, punishable. Uh, that reform, uh, there's reform there needed as well, and that is, uh, the legislature needs to take back its power <laughs> to define criminal activity. And uh, it should just merely be impossible for state departments and unelected officials to determine what behavior is criminal and what behavior isn't. So that's one thing that the legislature uh, can do uh, right now. They should do it um, immediately. It's just a good governance, individual right protect, rights protecting sort of uh, thing that needs to happen. And uh, and that should be based on and, th and then the future penalties for violation of rules uh, should follow a very simple principle, which is they should be related to the activity uh, involved. So if you violate a rule related to uh, your apple orchard or uh, something along those lines, uh, the, the punishment is directly related to your activity. So it's a it's a fine if it's your business or uh, you might lose you might lose your license uh, or get it suspended or go on probation or, or those sorts of things. We shouldn't assign criminal penalties and put uh, these uh, marks against people on their criminal records because they violated some rule that a bureaucrat wrote 70 years ago that no one knows anything about and that uh, the government selectively decided to enforce on that day. Uh, so that's that's the thing that we need to do. No matter no matter what happens here, we need to get rid of that practice. Right, and that's true in the federal government as well. The uh, Congress has really lost its oversight over the agencies. The federal government is just kind of funny, where where Congress passes laws that prevent the executive from acting sensibly, like the bargaining that's a law that prevents them from managing personnel, for example. Uh, but then. Uh, the executive branch writes all these rules, some with criminal penalties, with virtually no oversight by by Congress, and it's 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 you know it's the worst of both worlds. Well, I mean, it's it sounds like there are a number of different ways uh, to get at this area of reform, and it's complicated. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here with this mountainous mess before us. Uh, but an important step is clearly that we put sunlight on this issue in increasing form. And we one one way we're doing that is by discussing this today with the two of you. So it's critically important that those uh, tuning in uh, stay on top of this issue. Talk with your lawmakers about it. Find out, you know, dig in, uh, look at the studies that Philip and uh, and Mike have have produced and uh, be a part of holding our uh, bureaucrats and our lawmakers accountable. Uh, I'm going to open it up for questions now. Uh, as a reminder, you can submit questions by clicking on the Q&A box to the right of your screen and typing your question into the chat box. And we already have a number of questions that have poured in, uh, not surprisingly. So I'm just going to go through these one by one. And if for some reason we need to end today's discussion uh, without getting to your question, we will absolutely follow up with you and make sure that we get those questions answered. So uh, the first question is from Ed, uh, who asks, "Are you who are you working with in state governments to get this ball rolling? Uh, Philip, I'll start with you since you've worked with a number of different administrations around the country. 
You know, it's interesting. Uh, um, in the last couple of years, we've been mainly working with the federal government. Uh, the Trump administration adopted some of our reforms and made them regulations for permitting of infrastructure. Uh, uh, there are a bunch of members of Congress that have proposed uh, pandemic, uh, independent pandemic commissions that we've recommended to change the rules on, on, on how government uh, deals with pandemics. Um, and we haven't uh, recently uh, been working with many governors. I've done some work with Doug Ducey in Arizona. Um, and uh, but that's really uh, it recently. We would love to uh, do some work in Michigan. I just got an inbound call from Kentucky asking us to uh, help them come up with a new um, uh, model for policing, you know, sort of oversight of police and such. Um, but um, but we're but but we're ready to help. The one thing I would say is there's something new here, which is. The debate has always, in recent years, been no government, big government. What we're trying to say is let's change the operating system of government. Let's just make it work for the things that we agree it ought to do. And right now, it doesn't do that because of all the reasons Michael has written about, I've written about in my books. And so the idea of focusing on the broken operating system is a little less polarized than the, the, the current right-left debate. And I think it's really important to, to move the narrative in that direction. You'll get more people supporting you. It's a little less scary to tell people, we just want it to work practically. We want people to use their common sense. And, uh, you know, and maybe we could get somewhere. Mike, uh, could you comment on how the Mackinac Center has been working on this issue and who we've been working with here in Michigan? Yeah, so uh, we've been working with uh, a variety of, of groups, uh, including uh, state departments. Uh, there is one state department, uh, the Michigan Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs, which, uh, you know, this is their area of, uh, of uh, policy over, oversight. And uh, at times, uh, that department is interested in reforms and uh, cleaning up our rules and making them make more sense and having them function better. But a lot of times that depends on who is running that department and uh, what that department's priorities are. Uh, they might have other priorities uh, that pop up from time to time. So it, again, uh, the progress we make on it is, is hampered by having to work with these already really complicated and, regula and reg heavily regulated uh, uh, departments. And so that's, that's part of the problem. Uh, but this issue is gaining uh, momentum, I think, uh, around the country uh, among people. I mean, the, the idea that the administrative state is um, too large and dysfunctional and a problem uh, is gaining, uh, I think. And pe people, you know, the, the interesting thing about this is people's uh, interaction with government is more likely to come through this regulatory apparatus than it is through any other means because you know the number of ways that the government regulates our lives through these rules is vast so people are there there is a growing concern i think about this problem and and hopefully that will um that will uh, allow us to make some progress moving forward so the next question comes from ron who essentially asks uh you know or suggests that it seems that a number of these rules and regulations come or are influenced by people who are educated and trained as lawyers so does that mean that we have too many lawyers in the mix here and uh philip yes. you can talk it's my fault um yeah i plead guilty um we have way too many lawyers yeah uh, and the one thing I would add to that is it's amazing how stupid smart people can be. And so you can go out into the country and talk to a guy who runs a car repair shop or a farm and have a conversation about how government works. And they will see right away the problem of micromanagement and of rule books that are so thick that nobody can know them. But if you go talk to a, a lawyer, or legal and intellectual, and you have this conversation, they can't even imagine a, a, 
the a concept of a rule of law that doesn't involve telling people exactly how to do things. Well, the Constitution doesn't tell people how to do things. It says no unreasonable searches and seizures. That's four words. And those four words are pretty effective at keeping police from barging into our homes and making us free. So why do we think we have to create thousand page manuals for everything? We didn't have thousand page manuals in the 1950s. The interstate highway system was built with a 29 page statute in 1956. 10 years later, 21,000 miles have been built. Today, this last transportation bill is over 500 pages. It takes 10 years just to get a permit to do one mile. You know, it's just, we don't, you know, it's a crazy system. Well, in the interest of time, we've got two more questions here, and I'm going to combine these, pose them to the both of you, and ask if you could give us your best 30-second answer. So I guess I'm not going to make it easy on you here, but Ed asks if there is some low-hanging fruit that would generate public interest and give the legislature something to focus on. And likewise, Peter asks about a specific idea of proposing to the legislature, let's just get rid of all of these regulations that are older than seven years and set us on a new path. So, Philip, I'll start with you. What is an example of some low-hanging fruit? I know you've already- I would do, yeah, I do, combining those two questions, sunset laws are really important. You know, you want to start with a blank piece of paper every seven years. We don't have that tradition here. That's a very important idea. And the laws I would focus on are the ones that affect people in their daily lives. Getting a permit, running a school, running a hospital, doing community activities. That's it. You know, how you deal with children. Take those five, you know, give back to parents the authority to, you know, to kind of raise their children in a reasonable way. You know, do those five things, change it. You'd get, you'd be so popular with doctors and nurses and teachers and small business. You get a groundswell of support. Yeah, excellent place to start. Mike, I'll let you close us out with your best 30-second answer on this. Yeah, I would echo, Philip, I think dealing with or looking at daycare, child care, those sorts of things that are heavily regulated would be maybe some low-hanging fruit. But I say that with a caveat that that problem has been there for years and we haven't been able to make much progress yet. So I don't know exactly how low that fruit is hanging. But there are definitely lots of rules that negatively impact lots of people and make their lives harder and more costly to operate. And those are the ones that we should pick first, I think, to focus on. Absolutely. Well, we have a lot of hard work to do ahead of us, but thankfully we have people like those who have joined us for this call who are invested in seeing this be successful. So thank you to both of our panelists, Philip and Mike, for your research and the time that you've spent on this issue, providing really valuable insights to everyone today. That brings us to a close for our conversation. But before we do, I just want to note that the Mackinac Center is funded solely on the private goodwill donations of supporters like yourself who believe in our mission and want to make an impact together. If you would like to make a gift to the Mackinac Center and may be interested in seeing what events are coming up next, please visit Mackinac.org. We hope to see you again soon. Have a great day.